Welcome to the online video lecture series on Macbeth. We are in the middle of Act 4, Scene 3. In the previous segment of the lecture, we stopped at line 65. So now we shall continue our discussion of the text from line 66 onwards. Last time we noticed that uh, Macduff, who came over to England to convince Malcolm, the eldest son of late King Duncan, to reclaim his uh, honor, reclaim his position as the future King of Scotland by defeating and killing such a tyrant as Macbeth, was being dissuaded by Malcolm, who was uh, telling about his villainies, telling about his vices and uh, was giving Macduff the impression that if Malcolm would become a ruler of Scotland, the situation of the country would be much worse than what it had been under the reign of Macbeth. So now Macduff replies to Malcolm's self-condemnations, Malcolm's self-criminalizing speeches. Macduff says, Boundless intemperance in nature is a tyranny. So a limitless indulgence, limitless um, sensual pleasure is a kind of tyranny in someone's nature, in someone's character. It hath been the untimely emptying of the happy throne and fall of many kings. And this kind of sensual indulgence, this kind of promiscuity has always been the sole reason of uh, untime, untimely downfall of several kings. But fear not yet to take upon what you, sorry, to take upon you what is yours. You may convince, sorry, you may convey your pleasure in a spacious plenty and yet seem cold the time you may so hoodwink. So uh, Macduff still uh, keeps on trying to convince and persuade Malcolm of the possibility of his being the next ruler after Macbeth in spite of all the villainies, all the vices that he has um, talked about. He says that, but you need not be afraid, you need not uh, be much worried about the impacts of your vices on um, the countrymen of our land, on the subjects of your nation. He says, but fear not yet to take upon you what is yours. But you need not be worried about reclaiming what is already and duly yours. As the eldest king of, uh, sorry, as the eldest son of our late King Duncan, you are the rightful owner of the throne and you should be bold enough, you should be straightforward enough to reclaim that. Then he says, you may convey your pleasures in a spacious plenty. Uh, here convey means uh, to secretly enjoy. Uh, you can enjoy your pleasures, you can uh, satisfy your sensual desires in a spacious plenty and yet seem cold the time you may so hoodwink and in spite of all your avarices, all your greeds, all your um, promiscuous activities, all your uh, frivolities and all your voluptuous deeds, you can still appear to be a chaste and honest king in front of the public and you can always hoodwink, you can always uh, dupe uh, 
the people around you into believing that you are a cold, a cool sort of a person. We have willing dames enough, they cannot be the there cannot be the vulture in you to devour so many as will to greatness dedicate themselves, finding it so inclined. And uh, he says that even if you are as much voluptuous as you claim, you need not be worried. There are plenty of dames, plenty of women in our country who would be willing to be your mistresses to satisfy your sensual desires. Then Malcolm says, With this there grows in my most ill-composed affection such a staunchless avarice that were I king, I should cut off the nobles for their lands, desire his jewels and this other's house, and my more having would be as a sauce to make me hunger more, that I should forge quarrels unjust against the good and loyal, destroying them for wealth. Uh, then when uh, Malcolm sees that Macduff has not been fully convinced of his villainy, of his uh, vicious nature, when he spoke about uh, his uh, voluptuous nature, he further uh, condemns himself by falsely describing his avarice, his greed. And he says that if I become the king, I would never be satisfied with what I have, uh, what I have as the king, what I have acquired as the king. And I will always try to accumulate more wealth by either killing or by robbing my noblemen, my courtiers. Malcolm says, with this, with my voluptuous nature, there grows in my most ill-composed affection, in my most uh, badly bred, unruly nature, such a staunchless avarice, such a limitless amount of greed, that were I king, I should cut off the nobles for their lands. And uh, the avarice or greed in my nature is so immense, is so powerful that if I were the king, I would have killed my own noblemen, my own courtiers for uh, what they have, for uh, taking from them what they acquired, especially their lands. Desire his jewels and this other's house. I would then rob this courtier of his jewels or I would uh, take possession of the house or palace owned by some other courtier. And my more having would be as a sauce to make me hunger more. And my attitude of accumulating more wealth would be rather an incentive, would rather act like a sauce or appetizer that would keep on waiting, keep on enhancing my hunger, my appetite for more wealth. I will never be satisfied. The more wealth will be accumulated by me, the more wealth will be acqu acquired by me, the more, the stronger will be my desire. That I should forge quarrels unjust against the good and loyal, destroying them for wealth. And uh, out of this avarice, I would be forging, I would be uh, inventing unjust quarrels with the good and loyal noblemen and I would be destroying them, I would be killing them to grab their wealth. Then Macduff says, this avarice sticks deeper, grows with most, uh, sorry, grows with more pernicious root than summer seeming last and it hath been the sword of our slain kings. Uh, now still Macduff tries to, to uh, uh, Macduff is not yet fully convinced of the villainy of uh, Malcolm 
and he thinks that in spite of his avarice, his voluptuous nature, Malcolm can still be uh, a worthy substitute for uh, a tyrant like Macbeth. He says, this avarice, this kind of greed seems to be, seems to have a deeper and more harmful effect than the short-lived voluptuousness. Summer seeming is um, a strange coinage by Shakespeare. It implies that which, is, which has a short span like the days of summer. Lust has been called summer seeming. Uh, it implies that lust or the lustful nature of a person would not continue lifelong. It, it, is, uh, it must have a very short duration in one's entire lifetime. But this uh, bad quality of avarice, this uh, vice of greed, is even more harmful and even uh, deeper in nature than voluptuousness, than lust. And he says that uh, this avarice or greed has been the sole reason of the deaths of many kings. This avarice has always acted like a sword which led to the deaths of many kings. Yet do not fear. In spite of your avarice, you need not worry. Uh, you need not be worried. Scotland hath poisons to fill up your will. Poisons is an archaic word for plenty or abundance. Our land, Scotland, has plenty of wealth that would uh, fill up your demands, that would meet your uh, avaricious demands of your mere own. If those demands, if those cravings are only your own, then our land uh, will be successful in meeting them, in uh, in filling them up. All these are portable with other graces weighed. And all your uh, bad qualities, all your vices, like your lustful nature, like your greed, are portable, are endurable, or tolerable with other graces weighed, with your other accomplishments, with your other qualities. Uh, when we are, uh, when we compare your uh, vices, your wrongdoings, against the greater qualities, against the good qualities that you possess, then these vices seem to be of much uh, less significance, much less um, importance. And they seem to be portable and endurable if we compare them against your other good qualities, your graceful qualities. And Malcolm replies, saying that, but I have none. I do not possess any of the good qualities that you are talking about. The king becoming gracious as justice, verity, temperance, stableness, bounty, perseverance, mercy, lowliness, devotion, patience, courage, fortitude, I have no relish of them but abound in the division of each several crime, acting in many ways, acting it many ways. Uh, then uh, Malcolm gives a whole list of the desirable virtues, the desirable qualities that a uh, king must possess. And he says that I do not possess any of these graceful qualities, these virtues that you are talking about, that you are mentioning. what he calls the king becoming graces are the qualities, are the virtues which must accompany a good ruler of a nation. These are justice, that means the sense of judgment, verity, that is strong principle, um, uh, truthfulness or moral values, temperance, that means uh, level-headedness, um, the quality of being very um, 
composed and self-controlled stableness that is uh, an odd sort of usage by Shakespeare stableness means stability bounty uh, munificence perseverance uh, the quality of diligence of persistence mercy lowliness a king must be very humble in nature devotion patience courage fortitude fortitude also means uh, courage or the power to endure um, one's uh, misfortunes one's hardships and Malcolm says that I have no relish of them I do not have any of these qualities but abound in the division of each several crime acting it many ways but I have my own shares in different sorts of crimes in different sorts of vices and sins and I keep on exercising those vices in different ways nay had I power I should pour the sweet milk of conquer into hell uproar the universal peace confound all unity on earth and here nay means to say more moreover moreover if I had stately power in my hands if I were a king indeed then I must have uh, brought about an entire catastrophe all over the world not just in my own country not just in my own territory but if I were a king indeed then I must have uh, brought about trouble all over the world then Macduff is so utterly hopeless so frustrated that he cries out oh Scotland Scotland uh, expressing his utter grief his utter hopelessness and Malcolm says if such a one be fit to govern speak I am as I have spoken and Malcolm says so if you think such a person as I am is fit to govern Scotland then speak out then I am agree I am indeed what I have uh, I, I am indeed that kind of a person as I have uh, described as I have spoken out to you and Macduff uh, quite strongly and uh, disgustedly says fit to govern no not to leave no such a person as you have described of yourself is not only unfit to govern our land not only govern not only unfit to be the ruler of a land but he is not even fit to live on earth oh nation miserable with an untitled tyrant bloody sceptered when shalt thou see thy wholesome days again since that the truest issue of thy throne by his own interdiction stands accursed and does blaspheme his breed now, out of utter frustration uh, Macduff uh, apostrophically addresses his motherland Scotland and asks her when she would be facing her good days her good times once again when she is under the tyrannical rule of an unjust uh, ruler of a ruler who has um, who has uh, usurped uh, the previous lawful ruler and is now tyrannizing the countrymen and when who could be the rightful successor of the throne is such bad natured by his own admission he says uh, own nation miserable oh uh, my miserable land oh my miserable country with an untitled tyrant he refers to Macbeth as uh, an untitled tyrant he is a tyrant who is untitled that means who has uh, of course become the king but uh, is not justly entitled to be so though he has been able to 
ascent to the throne, his ascension is unjust. He is not uh, legally or morally entitled to be the ruler. And he is bloody sceptered. His sceptre is uh, smeared with blood of the people he has uh, unlawfully killed. When shalt thou see thy wholesome days again? When will you see your good times once again? Since that the truest issue of thy throne by his own interdiction stands accursed and does blaspheme his breed. This reference is to Malcolm. And Macduff means to say that um, the bad times of my motherland is not going to end so easily or so soon because who is the rightful successor of the Scottish throne is by his own interdiction or is by his own acknowledgement, his own self-condemnation stands accursed or stands cursed, stands condemned and does blaspheme his breed. Uh, he, Malcolm, uh, as Macduff thinks, Malcolm is blaspheming or Malcolm is um, sacrilegiously condemning and uh, and uh, vitiating the good reputation of his own royal lineage because his father and his forefathers were virtuous person and himself being such a uh, lustful, avaricious and uh, vicious person Malcolm is uh, polluting and and um, harming the reputation of the great lineage he comes of. Then he continues, Thy royal father was a most sainted king. Your royal father, the late King Duncan, was one of the most saintly kings on earth. The queen that bore thee, oftener upon her knees than on her feet, died every day she lived and your mother um, the Scottish Queen the wife of King Duncan was so devoted to gods and goddesses that uh, more often than not she was on her knees than on her feet uh, that signifies her uh, her um, devotional practices, her God worshipping for the greater time of the day. And she died every day she lived. That means uh, she did not enjoy her life. She was not a uh, very indulgent sort of a lady. She was a very devoted kind of a lady who um, seemed to lay down her life at the altar of the gods. Fare thee well. Now he finally takes leave from Mac Malcolm and says farewell, goodbye. These evils thou repeatest upon, my, upon thyself have banished me from Scotland. In you I see the same reflection, same repetition of the vices, of the bad qualities which led to my banishment from Scotland. Though Macduff was not actually banished from Scotland, he uh, willfully moved over to England so that he could persuade Malcolm to wage a war against uh, Macbeth. But he says that in you I see the repetition, in you I see the exact reflection of the same vices, same evils that uh, forced me to leave my own country. O oh my breast, thy hope ends here. O oh my heart, your hopes must end here. Then Malcolm uh, understands that Macduff has always been very much truthful and free from any kind of treachery or duplicity and 
finally now he reveals his uh, true nature to Macduff. So Malcolm says, Macduff, this noble passion, child of integrity, hath from my soul wiped the black scruples, reconciled my thoughts to thy good truth and humor, sorry, good truth and honor. So he says, Macduff, this noble passion, this uh, noble, this uh, honest uh, outburst of your passion, this outburst of your heart, this honest and noble emotion that you have shown in front of me, seems to be the child of integrity. Unless you have moral integrity in your heart, it is impossible for you to master, to evoke such strong and sincere passion. And so, I feel convinced of your goodness. And this novel passion hath from my soul wiped the black scruples. Here scruples actually mean doubts or suspicions. Uh, the suspicions or the doubts that I had in my heart against the possible duplicity, against the possible treachery from Macbeth to his agents have been wiped out by the show of sincerest passion that you have uh, presented in front of me. Reconciled my thoughts to thy good truth and honor and um, the exhibition of your sincere honest passion, your honest emotion has um, been able to reconcile, has, to, has been able to revert my thoughts otherwise and I am now inclined to believe that you are truly uh, an honorable person and a truthful and good human being. Devilish Macbeth by many of these trains hath sought to win me into his power. Uh, now Malcolm says that, um, Malcolm explains why he has always been so suspicious about the motives of uh, people who came to meet him. He explains that devilish Macbeth by many of these trains, here trains um, means devices or tactics or tricks and says that Macbeth has applied similar tricks on me, has tried to win me over by, ap by applying uh, similar tricks, similar devices. And modest wisdom plucks me from overcredulous haste. And it is my habitual wisdom, it is my habitual um, intellect which restrains me from being overcredulous, from being too much hasty. But God above deal between thee and me. But uh, the deal, the relation between you and me is now in the hands of God. For even now I put myself to thy direction and unspeak mine own detraction. Here abjure the trains and sorry the taints and blames I laid upon myself for strangers to my nature. Now he acknowledges that what he has been speaking about himself so far are all false, are all wrong and uh, untrue. He says that I put myself to thy direction. Now I am inclined to lead myself um, at your disposal. I now lend myself at your disposal. Now I, I am ready to move in the same direction that you show me. And unspeak mine own detraction. Now I deny abjure my own self-condemnation. I am denying all those descriptions about my villainy that, uh, that I have been speaking for so long. Here abjure the taints and blames. Now I deny, now I abjure all the 
vices and all the blames, all the possible charges I laid upon myself for strangers to my nature and now I acknowledge that all those vices, all those charges, blames are strangers to my nature. My true nature is free from those vices, those charges. I am yet unknown to woman. I am yet uh, chaste man. I am not as voluptuous as I previously described. Never was foreshown, scarcely have coveted what was mine own. And I have never broken a pledge, I have never betrayed anybody, and I have never tried to possess what was not rightfully my own. At no time broke my faith, would not betray the devil to his fellow, and delight no less in truth than life. My first false speaking was this upon myself. And I am a very truthful person by nature, and this is the first time that uh, I have lied to anybody. What I am truly is thine and my poor country's to command, and what my true nature is, is now at the disposal of you and my countrymen. If I become the ruler of your land, then let you and my countrymen decide what kind of a person I truly am. Uh, then he says, Whether indeed, before thy here approach, old Seward, with ten thousand warlike men already at a point, was setting forth. Now he says that um, before you came here, before your approach here, um, old Seward, Seward uh, was uh, the then Earl of Northumberland, was ready with uh, ten thousand soldiers. He was, uh, he had the supply of 10,000 armed men, armed soldiers, who were ready to uh, set forth. Now we will together, and the chance of goodness be like our warranted quarrel. And he says that now we will act together, and the chance of goodness be like our warranted quarrel. Uh, this means that... Um, uh, that here quarrel means a war and warranted quarrel means a just war uh, a war which is uh, morally right because uh, here one is going to reclaim the due honor the due position one deserves and he says that our chance of goodness the the chance of our victory be like our warranted quarrel be uh, it may so uh, the he means to say that um, the chance of goodness the chance of our um, being victory uh, our being victorious our being uh, our being morally right would be guaranteed by the justness, by the legal and moral uh, righteousness of the war that we, that we are going to wage against uh, the tyranny of Macbeth. And having said all these things, he asks Macduff, why are you silent? Because he notices that uh, um, Macduff, who must have been quite taken aback by this sudden reversal of tone, by this sudden um, denial by Malcolm of all he had uh, said previously, is um, silent because he has been stupefied. And now Macduff replies, such welcome and unwelcome things at once it is hard to reconcile. You have said so soothing and so disturbing things at the same time that it is um, rather difficult for me to reconcile. I must need some time to, um, to gain my composure. I must um, take some time to 
pacify mind because I am not accustomed to encountering such welcome and unwelcome things such uh, positive and negative news at the same time so let us stop here for the time being and in our next lecture we will be continuing with the rest of the text thank you <laughs>